Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 377 for Monday, March 20th, 2023. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Our sponsor for this episode is Capo from Super Mega Ultra Groovy at capoapp.com. This is your app that gives you song learning superpowers. We'll talk more about what those are and how it works and how you can get it for free shortly here. But for now, finally, back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. You know, um, I noticed something. I, la- well, so last week we recorded right after I got to Austin. I think, uh, if if memory serves, I had right. gone. I had gone and seen that movie about Joan Baez, which we talked about here. And then immediately after I left, I went to see if I could make my way into the New Order concert in in Austin that was part of South by Southwest, and I did. I made it in. New Order, the the 80s band, um, I mean, they, they're still a band, but you know they came to prominence in the 80s. Um, I played some of their tunes in the 80s, Paul, but like they, I was never, I, I would never say I was a fan. I knew some of their songs only because I learned them for a band that I was in, and like in high school or whatever. And But I thought, okay, this will be interesting. Um, what I didn't share on, on Monday, just because we didn't get to it, is uh, when I was in Vegas on Friday, I saw... Keith Urban, who I had seen once before. I saw him at South by Southwest, kind of a last minute thing like the New Order show. And he's a fantastic performer. Uh, he's also a great singer, great songwriter, and he can play the guitar uh, really well. So with I knew Lisa was going to be out with us in, in, uh, in Vegas, and I knew Keith has his residency out there. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, let's go see that. So I saw that on Friday night. And I saw New Order on Monday night. And the one constant between those two shows was that both shows were played to a click track. Now, uh, Keith Urban's show, the band is playing to a click, but you never hear the click. Mm-hmm. The New Order show, you hear this. You probably don't. We probably don't hear the click. Uh, certainly, I think there's probably an actual click that's happening that's in their ears, but not in not in the house. But we hear the sequencers and and it's obvious that, that these sequencers are happening and the band is playing to them. The Keith Urban show felt really sterile to the click in, in, in an interesting way. Like the, the, the band members never really looked at each other to like lock in or anything because there was this, this inaud- un, inaudible click, audible to them, but not audible to us. So they were just all kind of like playing along to the click. And there was one moment in the show where they went, you know, I'll call it acoustic where Keith played like a banjo. The drummer had a whatever tambourine or something. And that clearly was not played to a click. And the tempo sort of had that human flow to it. And, and it was obvious. It was like, ah, right. Okay. This feels a little more natural, but it just felt a little bit stiff is the wrong word. I think sterile is the, the right word there. It was just too precise with the time, you know, a song never got like a little bit of excitement by accelerating the tempo or anything like that. Obviously the new order show was exactly the same in terms of the tempo, but because I could hear, I noticed like three quarters of the way through the show that I was like super engaged and it felt natural. And it's because those songs are all like the, the, the foundation of the tunes are like this, you know, you know, the, the, the 16th note, like sequencers or whatever. And they're playing along with them. And it just felt more natural. Uh, and, and I, it like, it made me think about the times where I've had to play with a click, you know, like where there's tracks or something. And if the track, it, it, so I, I, I came up with sort of a rule of thumb. If this isn't like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, you know, die on this particular hill, but, um, <laughs> I feel like, you know, the way I'm going to approach tracks is if there is good reason, if the track is, is there for 
the, you know, for the audience to hear something and it, and again, just prioritizing the audience. Like if the audience needs to hear something that cannot be replicated on stage, then great play the track. And of course, obviously play along to the track. You got to stay in sync with it. That goes without saying, but otherwise if the, if the click is just there for the, for the sake of having a click there to keep the songs at exactly the right tempo all the way through, I would, I would have a, I would look at that with a more critical eye of like, why, why are we choosing to do this? What's the benefit of this? Um, certainly starting songs with a click to make sure that, you know, adrenaline isn't changing your perception of where the tempo should be fine, you know, but, but use it for the count off and then off you go. Um, I, it, it, like that's, so were, were there in the urban show, was there, were there tracks or were there, you know, sequences that were, if there Being were, used, obviously. there might have been, uh, but they weren't material to the show. Like there were mm. yeah, with six musicians on stage or something. All the sort of key parts to the songs, the harmonies, everything were covered by by musicians doing them live. So, yes, there might have been some sort of underlying subtle things coming from tracks, but I'm not but, I, but not nothing that like was was instrumental to making the song it would have the, the songs would have felt fine without that stuff i would think so the tra- so the tracks didn't add anything and playing to the click made them sterile sounds like a lose lose mhm yeah it just felt a little like there were moments where it was just like okay these guys are clearly playing to that click and you know i'm am i more sensitive than the average bear to this stuff yes obviously of course look i do this show right i'm crazy but um but it just felt a little and I mentioned it to Lisa afterwards. She's like, yeah, she's like, there was something that didn't feel live about that show. It just felt all too produced. I'm like, yeah, well, that's because it was. Yeah. It was just weird not seeing the drummer and the bass player like lock in at the beginning of a tune every now and then, you know, just to find the pocket or whatever. It was like, no, nope, no, nope, we're just going to play to the click. It's all good. The last yeah. time I saw him, the bass player was sick and, uh, and so there was no bass player. They just played his tracks that they recorded from a prior show. When I saw him in Austin for that, that one-off gig, whatever it was, five, six, seven years ago or something. And it was, again, he's, a, he's an entertaining, like his band is entertaining. Keith Urban's entertaining. They clearly like playing music together. They, they, it's, it, 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 it seems to me that they actually like each other. It's yeah, I've seen some artists where it's like here to do the job and I can't wait to leave, you know, that kind of thing. That's not the case with Keith Urban's band. They they clearly like have fun together and they have fun playing together. So there was all of that and they all can play their butts off. I mean, it like and the, the harmonies were much better with the bass player there because he sings. He's like the primary harmony singer mm. and and hearing being able to, you know, hear his harmonies was like, oh, wow. OK, this is like. This this actually adds to the show. So I mean, it was a good show. It was fine. Like I'm not upset that I went, but there was that element of it. it just I don't know. It was, it was just an That's interesting thing to notice, and then be at the New Order show, and three quarters of the way through, say, "Wait a minute, this is obviously to a click." Like there's no question whatsoever. Well, the style of music, but is it's that the kind style of... of music. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what New Order did, which I thought was cool, and I'm gonna uh, betray my ignorance here. I had no idea that New Order. Uh, was created because the lead singer of Joy Division had like passed away suddenly and the band decided to reform and called themselves New Order and and changed a couple of things around. But at the end of the show, the encore was three Joy Division songs and those they played without a click. And it felt more like a rock, like it 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 brought the level up. It it definitely had a more rock and feel to it. Um you know, instead of there being like the, the first song they played and I don't, don't ask me the names of these things. I'd have to look it up on the set list or whatever, but the first song they played of the encore had a 16th note, like Tom pattern that the drummer actually played. It was more notes than the guy had played all night long. He was, I mean, he was a fantastic <laughs> drummer, but like, he, you know, through the verses, he's playing this, you do, you know, this whole syncopated thing. And it was like, Oh wow. Holy crap. But it wasn't, it it was well played and obviously every member of the band, including the drummer can play to a click. They had just done it for like 90 minutes with all these tunes, 
but it had a little bit of a swing to it because it was a human playing the toms. And in order to get to the crash symbol on, you know, every other downbeat, he had to reach his hand over. And so there's like a little bit of a lag to that. You know, it's like it, it made it feel a little bit looser and a little swingier, um, even though it was, you know, a 16th note groove. So I don't know. It was just just something I noticed. So these are the wonder things. how many how many touring acts you think are playing to a click rock like classic rock touring acts. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I would bet less than half. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of bands out there that use a click to start tunes. I, I like. I, I see that happen a lot where. Somebody in the band, whoever's counting off the tune, sometimes mostly the drummer, but not always, clearly has a click there, sees it, it uses that to start the tune. It's just to make sure that the starting point is the correct starting point, or at least it's consistent yeah. night to night. And I've done that too. I, there, there, I think there's a lot of benefit in that. But then once the tune starts, it's a band playing the song. Yeah. I saw, I saw the zombies. While I was at South by speaking of classic yeah. rock touring acts, I mean, that's what? older than classic rock. I think that is correct. But <laughs> holy two of the guys in the band, Colin Blumstein, I think, uh, yeah. the singer and Rod Argent, uh, the keyboard player are the original members. The rest of the guys are, you know, hired guns, uh, or, or whatever their status is. I don't know, but they're not original members. Yeah. They, they might be official members of the band at this point. I don't know, but they're not original. Were they members. obviously younger than the other two? Uh, yeah, I mean, they were younger, but probably still older than me. <laughs> Rod and Colin are 77. Right. But Col- just imagine that for a second. Just, I know. Just, just think about what you just said. I know. That- <laughs> Dude, 77. These, these guys came out of the gate on fire. And Colin Blumstein's voice is uh, like, is spectacular. I, I just. I can't even begin to describe how silky smooth his voice is. Like he has no trouble hitting notes, but not just no trouble. Like he, he delivers them with poise and grace. And yet when it's time to rock, he can rock them too. the harmonies in that band. uh, I mean, Rod Argent sings a bunch. The bass player sings a bunch and the guitar player uh, sings slightly less than the, the other guys in terms of harmonies, but uh, their harmonies are off the charts, man. Like that band, I went, I went to that to, because it's the zombies. Like they've been around arguably longer than the Beatles, right? They started before the Beatles. So it was like, yeah, I got, I got a, Is that right? I think they came, their first record was like 1961 or something. Yeah. That's so weird. She's not there as what, like, 65 or 65 i think yeah 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 yeah. and uh time of the time of the season came out before like it it came out then they broke up and then like two years later for whatever reason time of the season became the you know immutable staple that it now is right but like the band was over for the first time anyway um before that happened but they, they were so good. And and then, uh, you know, when they broke up, Rod Argent and Chris, whatever his name was, their original bass player, went and wrote a bunch of tunes that Rod then went and played in his band, Argent. And so mm-hmm. they, they played Hold Your Head Up um, yep. toward the end of the night, too. And Colin sang it. Uh, and it was fantastic. Rod Argent, you know, they're so English and and they're, they're I mean, they're elder statesmen of, of rock and roll, right? Yeah. And, uh, but they, um, but, but anyway, Rod, uh, before hold your head up, he explained the story of it. Like they, they're, they're very much into telling their stories, which is fine. And Rod explained that the lyrics are not hold your head up. Whoa. They are hold your head up woman. And the reason was that the Chris, the bass player who wrote the tune or wrote, at least wrote the lyrics was writing them about his wife who was going through some tough times. And he was, you know, basically saying, you've got this, you just, you know, you power through and you're going to make this, you know, and it's going to work out. I don't know the end of that story. I don't know if he was correct, uh, in, <laughs> in, in his, in his wishes, but those are the lyrics. So every time the chorus came, you know, Rod would be there. All right. You know, ready to sing with us. You know, it's kind of one of those sort of hokey, but, but, but you give him permission because they're 77 and 
That's how it works. <laughs> but you know, this goes to our our ongoing conversation about the staying power of music that comes from any generation, right? It's it's we played um, "Happy" together the other night. Oh at, yeah. Uh, okay, and again, if you're looking for those songs that 18 year olds and 80 year olds will sing together. That was one of them, right? Yeah. Like it was amazing to me that 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 younger kids knew that song and had a smile on their face and were joyfully participating, you know. But how much stuff from the '90s and 2000s will have this? And I think a large part is because music that was written during, like, like, like back then, rock and roll was part of societal change and social change, and it wasn't as, you know, certainly wasn't as as fa- prefabricated as sure. it got to be a little bit later. Sure. But you know, it it is, I think there is a lesson in there that, you know, there's music that cha- truly changed the world, not just took advantage of a market. Correct. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. Yeah. I'm curious to see what songs last. I mean, we look at the eighties now and the eighties has essentially become classic rock in, in that sense. There are some songs from the eighties that are just, part of the the rock and roll canon, part of the rock and roll fake book, if you will. I'm yeah. curious to see which songs from the 90s and the 2000s, you know, sort of stand their own tests of time uh, and how it goes. I will say this, and this shocked me. I was, the, the, the Zombies played at Stubbs, which is an outdoor venue. It's the venue where I saw R.E.M. It's the venue where I saw the Foo Fighters at South By. It's the, the, the biggest of the downtown outdoor venues. And it holds maybe, uh, let's say, 2,500 people. It's not very much. But I was up front for the Zombies. I was, you know, maybe four or five people back from the stage because I didn't want to be any closer because I wanted to be able to hear. And I saw where the speakers were aimed. So I stopped moving forward when I got to that point. But um, up front there, I was one of the oldest people that close. Most of the people around me were, you know, 15, 20, 25 years, my, my junior. And they knew more of the words to all the zombies tunes than I did. It was fascinating to see just how like these 20 somethings that were huge zombies fans. I, it just blew me away. Well, I, yeah, I, I still don't understand it. I, I probably need to do some research on that. If you, if you know anything about this phenomenon, folks, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Help me out here. I don't know. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you play, uh, you, you played, uh, you played, a uh, the Paul O. Kent experience, didn't you? I did. You know, what? We, 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 I put together a band to play Irish traditional music and, um, it was fantastic, man. It was it was it was promoted as such, like come here Irish traditional music, and I have a local friend who is um he's toured through Ireland he has a bunch of he's he's more folk musician I wouldn't say an American folk he's a folk musician okay and you know he knows Irish folk music very well and Scottish folk music, and he's put out several original albums and i and I've always wanted to do something with him I said, hey, let's do this together and he said yes, he actually sang most of the songs and he was terrific his name is Steve Critter. you should look him up because you know for that genre of music he is absolutely the real deal he played mandolin and some acoustic guitar and then couple guys that I play with, uh, Russ, you know, Russ played drums on it. And he, he did absolutely spectacular job adding drum parts where sometimes there weren't drum parts for some of these things. Ah. Um, and it was just one of those things, you know, obviously it's St. Patrick's Day. So people ought to have a good time. They clap along, they sing along, they laugh, they get a just total, total charge out of this type of stuff. And I am reminded that, you know, we say on this show, always be performing. And, I do think it's true that you can be successful with almost any type of music if you are entertaining. When I first started the House Rockers, we were playing music that I thought would do that. It would be something different that people couldn't hear in many places. And I think I've told you, I, it was a lot of the East Coast music that I grew up with that I just loved so much. But my musicians weren't totally bought into it. it they sure. weren't comfortable with it. They didn't get it, right? They didn't understand. And yeah, right, exactly. It, it wasn't the music that moved them, right? right? And I didn't understand that when I started the band. I thought, like, you know, just play good music, and if it's and as long as you perform it well, you know, you'll be able to find so, someone. But, you know, musicians who had been around were like, you know, this is, this is a long path to success. If we want a short path to success, you know, 
eighty percent rock and roll fake book, you know, or or you know, rock and soul fake book. Yep. You know, cool in the gang and Earth, Wind, and Fire stuff, and twenty percent you have some fun, and that formula is kind of what we have adapted. But this was a very very exciting reminder that if you play joyous music and you play it joyously and you can be infectious if you're always performing you can go over with a lot of different types of music and i know and you know with my solo acoustic stuff i i very consciously pick music over the course of a night some of it is finger picked some of it is strummed some of it is more syncopated some of it is capo some of it is altered tunings and i'm always thinking i just want to create like this soundscape over the course of an evening that, you know, at the end of an evening, people feel like they, they felt something right. Yeah. Different than, different than just playing cowboy chords and, and, and doing, you know, around the campfire songs. And, um, I'm happy where that's going to, I'm learning as a performer, how to refine that stuff. You know, the stuff that will work, the stuff that absolutely won't work. And it's just this Irish music. It's Irish music. It's folk music. You know, it's three chords, you know, four chords, maybe, but if you play it well and you play it with a smile on your face and, you know, you connect with people in between the songs, you, I think you can be a great polka band. You can play anything and you can play the same places. You can play the same festivals if you are entertaining that anyone, anyone else can. It was, it was that type of a reminder for me. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, yes. It's the well, song. You're doing that basically with, with bitter pill, right? It's 100%. different music, yes. different instrumentation. But you got people who are just in love with the music. They love emoting the music. And you create this thing and you're inviting people to connect with you. And that's the always be performing message. That, that's, that's really what it's about. That's 100% correct. Yeah, it, right. It, you got to go out and deliver. And if you get on stage and are hesitant because you don't believe in your ability to connect with an audience when performing this music, you will be correct. You know, you have to, well, I mean, it's how it works. Prophecy. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy in both directions. But if you go out and just crush it and it's clear that you're emoting, whatever it is you're emoting, it could be joy. It could be some brooding sense, like whatever your vibe is. If you go out and deliver that and own it on, in a way that you are excited to do it and it's the thing you must do, then that connects with other humans. Absolutely, man. Yeah. I, yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's... It, it was, it was a great night. We had, we had a blast. And actually we only had one set. We never, guys had never played together. <laughs> we shared a set list. We shared some charts. The first set, we kind of talked through how to start the songs and, you know, how to end the songs. Uh, all very good players, big ears, you know, and yeah. the first set was good. Um, it was five o'clock in the afternoon and people were just kind of getting settled. And then the second set, we played the same thing, maybe added one or two or stretched one or two third set. We were really feeling it. And it was, you know, really, really fun. And it was just a great lesson in the power of do something truthful. Doesn't that doesn't mean complex. It can be simple. Nope. This music is largely simple. Some things are, you know, like some of the, some of the fiddle jigs that we did were like smoke and like there's uh, on my Facebook page, I shared a couple of them. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it was just a great reminder that the reason some music is eternal is because it connects with people. And, and you as a, as a cover artist have an opportunity to do that. If you do it right, if you do it and you're right, it's not just about a smile on your face. It's about whatever truth to the music that you have to connect. If you're in a sad mood, and, you know, I, I love the singer Ryan, not Brian Adams, Ryan Adams. He writes largely very emotional and sad music. And he's quite frank about that when he performs it live. And people come to see him for that experience. Like they, yeah. they need some commiserating, like a way to get in touch with that part of themselves. And he does it so well. I mean, he'll actually say, this is terribly sad music. I don't know why you people are here, <laughs> but he knows. He knows. He knows right? himself. Yeah. He knows he knows where he's connecting and at what level he's connecting. And so that it just really was energizing to know that you can take all different types of music, polka music, Irish music, classic rock, you know, whatever it may be, if you connect on a truthful level, authentic level, you you, you can build an audience, you can connect with an audience and, and you know have a great night. All right. This means I get to tell you about our sponsor. 
Capo from Super Mega Ultra Groovy. Capo is the best, and it is my go-to app for learning music by ear. Using standard you know, music and video players like YouTube or Apple Music app or Spotify make it really hard to move around a song and pinpoint the spot that you want to hear again, right? So that, you know, you can learn like a section of a tune. And even with apps where you can change the playback speed, like YouTube lets you do that, it sounds terrible, right? Well, Capo gives you song learning superpowers. It's got this high-end studio quality audio stretching technology that makes it so that when you do change the playback speed, it sounds great. And Capo has this transcription playhead that gives you precise control over the playback starting point and helps you learn songs in chunks. And it does more than that, too. It, it'll lift and detect and estimate chords. It'll detect beat locations. And Capo is completely free. There are no account signups, no ads, no sneaky free trial subscription to forget about. You've got nothing to lose. Go to capoapp.com or search for Capo in the App Store. It works on Mac, iPhone, or iPad. And really, there's no catch. Chris, the developer of Capo, is fine with you using their core features for free. He's betting that you'll eventually fall in love and maybe you'll want to pay extra for more features. Or you'll tell all your friends about this great free app and one of them might buy the extra features. They're in this for the long haul over there at Super Mega Ultra Groove. You're actually going to have Chris on the show to talk about not just Capo, but his experience as a musician and his history, because he's got some good stories like so many of our guests do. So again, Capo by Super Mega Ultra Groovy, C-A-P-O-A-P-P dot com. And our thanks to Chris and Super Mega Ultra Groovy and Capo for sponsoring this episode. While we're here, I want to tell you about another show to listen to. It's called The Unstarving Musician, hosted by Robonzo, who, as I've mentioned, has been on this show. And Robonzo started this as a way to help other independent musicians better understand the marketing, business, and creative processes that empower all of us to make music and make a living doing it. Episodes feature insights from Robonzo and his wide array of guests. Topics covered on The Unstarving Musician include songwriting, release strategy, recording, building an audience, music licensing, and more. And you can hear it at unstarvingmusician.com or wherever you get your audio. Now, thanks to Robonzo for doing this swap with us. All right, so I talked about some of the bands whose names you might know that I saw at South By. Now I want to tell you about two of the bands whose names you probably don't know, Paul. And the the first one that comes to mind that fits with this always be, both of them, and as do most of the bands I saw, fit in the always be performing category because it's mostly original bands that you're seeing at South By. In fact, I think it's certainly what I saw was all original bands. Uh, it was a band called Tales, T-A-Y-L-S, I am nearly certain that that is a twist on the name of their lead singer who uh, appears to be named Taylor. This band, uh, they're from Nashville, pa pa you know, power pop kind of vibe. And they just like from the moment they played and and every band at South by, by and large plays it has a 40 minute slot. So actually they have a full hour slot is how it works. Every generally it's at the top of the hours when you're supposed to go on, you finish no later than 40 minutes after the hour so that you have a, a 20 minute changeover where you get your stuff off. The next band gets their stuff on line checks and starts at the top of the hour. So most bands don't play a full 40 minute set because they want to be able to like play all of the tunes that they have. So most bands are playing somewhere between 30 and 35 minutes just to, to really hold it in. And so if you, if it takes your band 20 minutes to, you know, get warmed up into a set, that's probably not going to work out too well. You know, you, you need to come out of the gate and just go and display who you are. And it doesn't need to be full energy unless your band is full energy. And if it is, then you got to own it from moment one. And if you if you have that brooding vibe then you got to own that from moment one too, you got to get right in this band, fantastic harmonies. Uh, there Taylor was the lead singer. There's a, a woman and I don't have band member names here because I can't really pull this up. It doesn't, they don't have it on their website and an easy way to find, but there's a, a woman who plays keyboards and is essentially the, 
I guess you could say she's the primary har harmony singer, but really she's a, like a co-lead singer. Their harmonies and interaction together right out of the gate were like, okay, this is a band. Like there's something going on here. There's something to watch. The band was tight. And midway through the show, they grabbed like a, one of those automated confetti machines and just blasted confetti all over this club, which was kind of cool to see. So, uh, but it, it, like it kept the energy up and they like, here I am talking about them. They, they had great songs, great harmonies, great little hooks and great performers. So, uh, I'll put a link to them in the, in the show notes. The other band that really blew me away was a band called the banditos. Uh, I believe also out of Nashville, the, the great band, they kind of reminded me, man, if I had to describe them, they're kind of like a little more rock and roll. It's like, like the Alabama shakes meets the black crows. So a little more gritty than like Alabama shakes. And, and the reason I bring up Alabama shakes is because there's the singer of this band, the banditos this woman when she i think she's a better much better singer than britney howard um of alabama shakes but she has that kind of soulful quality when she belts it out she sounds like janice uh janice joplin she oh. she has that vibrato and and just that power that raw power however i also think she's a better singer than janice because when she isn't belting it out she has like this subtle, sultry thing and tone that was just fantastic. And the thing, and obviously that blew me away, just her voice. But on top of that was her mic technique. Like she understood how her voice worked with a microphone on a loud rock and roll stage. When she was being like soft and sultry, she was literally lips on the microphone. So like kissing the mic. When she was belting, Paul, I am not exaggerating. She would back off to like 18 inches, maybe two feet from the microphone. Now there was a drum set, maybe three feet behind her with no plexiglass or anything. Didn't matter. You could still hear her. Like she was that powerful and she understood it. She knew how to work a microphone to make it so that you always heard her, you know, as, as well as you needed to hear her. I was, I was blown away by that mic technique. She just, she understood it. I don't, I obviously don't know how she was trained or where or what, but I was like, wow. She was trained. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if she trained herself, she figured it out. Some, some, somehow she got there. Yeah. But man, like uh, what a voice, what a voice and a presence too. She had a, she had a, a joy about her when she sang, she was just, happy uh even if she was singing a sad song about like a breakup or something like she just had this this you know it was hard not to just watch her sing because of how joyful she was yeah That's fantastic cool. band yeah 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 it was um it was it, there were yeah and there were a lot of good bands there, there was there was one band um they i, I posted about them great fantastic like post-punk kind of meets power pop, but not quite power pop band from Bristol, UK. Uh, they have a stupid name. Now all bands have stupid names. I, I, I acknowledge this, but some names is a great name. Sure. It is Paul. Um, they, they <laughs> you, you, you actually rock houses like the, the houses, like <laughs> they, all bands are stupid. Like all band names are stupid. They have to be because the, the, you know, all the other ones are taken, but, um, I mean, fling's stupid, you know, bitter pill. What's that mean? You know, like Beatles, what the Beatles, like that was also stupid. It was like sort of catchy and like, you know, cliche, like weird. Like, it's like, oh, you're going to be clever with the name Beatles. So let's see where that gets you. Um, this band's name is Saloon Dion. That's fantastic. It's clever AF. Like it's one of the most <laughs> clever band names I've ever seen. However, if you see that band name somewhere, you're going to think there is some way related as a tribute band to Celine Dion. They are not. Like I said, they are a post-punk high energy outfit from the UK. They have nothing to do with Celine Dion. Brilliant name. 
it's the wrong name for them. I think it will, I think it will be self-defeating for them. I think it will limit where they wind up being able to go. I think they're going to have to change the name uh, because they were fantastic. It was like green day meets Oasis, but the, 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 the singer, nobody in the band can sing like the people in green day or Oasis could, but they had that energy and, and they had harmonies and stuff like they had, they can, they can, they're they're more than adequate enough at at the at the vocally, but it's all about their performance. They just it was like like if you took those two bands and then added the mighty mighty boss tones on top of them, they just tons of energy. So, but it's a stupid name, it's a stupid name. How old were the people in the band? Twenties, early twenties, I would mm, say. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, but I mean, great band, great band. The um. The changeovers, the logistics of this, right? And it, it, it's, this is not new. This happens every year at South by where you have 20 minutes to swap out from one band to another. For the most part, bands are using a uh, shared backline, but that's not always the case. And, uh, and still they make their 20 minutes work. Uh, I've seen entire drum sets swap in and out. You, you know, everything was fine. One thing that I heard this year more than I've ever noticed it in the past was guitar players saying, can I have more guitar in the monitor? And the first time I heard it, I didn't really, didn't really, you know, register. It was just like, okay, great. You know, fine, whatever. You need more guitar in the monitor. Um, by the fifth time that I heard it, it became evident that somewhere, somehow, like similar to our recent conversations about, you know, uh, don't touch the gains. Somebody told them, get your tone and leave it alone. Meaning, do not turn yourself up on stage. If you need more of you, have it come back at you in the monitor so that you're not adding more to the house mix of that guitar amp. Do you and, think that um, there's a coordination of South by, like they just hire a bunch of sound people, say you have this venue and yeah. go, or do you think that there is some conscious theme of, of how these shows are mixed or how these shows are approached? No, there's definitely a conscious theme. Every, I mean, most clubs South by brings in, uh, not just a sound engineer, but gear like a front of house PA that does not normally exist in these clubs. Um, and the way they do it. And, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm certain there's, there's a collective effort. Every single band played at a hundred DB, like, uh, exactly a right hundred DB at the soundboard. Yeah. And, and and that's loud, by the way, uh, you know, like I would prefer it to be 90, but in a lot of these smaller clubs, if you're mixing to 90 dB, the drums are almost, you know, like a drum, a, a snare drum or a guitar amp on stage that's a little bit too loud. It's just going to completely disrupt the mix. Right. And, and each band only plays for about 30 minutes. So you don't have time to really sort that out. So by pushing it up 10 dB to a hundred, it gives the engineer a whole lot more control. The vocals can always come through um, and, and it just works. So uh, yeah, I think there's, I think there's definitely a, a very, very uh, orchestrated thing that goes on with that. Yeah. Yeah. But it, like everything sounded good. That was the thing. There wasn't, I didn't go to one show where the sound was bad. It was, you know, it was always clear. It was always That's super amazing. loud. Yeah. 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 But, but um, that makes it even more amazing, right? Super loud and super clear. Come super on. clear. Yeah. I mean, 100 dB is loud. Like that's the the, the zombies were almost at 110, Paul. Like mm -hmm. that's talk about loud, but it was clear. It was louder, way louder than it needed to be for that show. Um, but anyway, you know, that's just what it was. But um, but yeah, it was just interesting to hear so many guitar players say, "Yeah, can you give me more back here?" And the engineers were happy to do it. You know, you know. Um, but it, I, I, my guess is they also as part of that sort of orchestration, they must send something out to the bands telling them how to get through a sound check. I mean, I, I, I think you would know this. I know this, but I, and like m some people who play in bands don't know, like when you're doing a quick changeover, if somebody, you know, when somebody's checking their keyboard or their vocal mic or whatever, everybody in the band would put their hand in the air until they had enough of that person in their monitor. And then they take their hand down. Right. And, and that just happened 
across the board. I watched it. There was never a conversation from the engineer. Never see a band that that was ahead of the game on their on their twenty minute setup and actually got to play a little bit longer. Yes, most bands, uh, most nice. bands started at five of. Yeah, yeah. The only band that didn't. It was stupid. It was this band called Pearl Earl. Um, it was the the last band that I saw. It wasn't going to be the person, the lead singer, of the the prior band was like, this next band is fantastic. The, they named the drummer. They're like, she's the best drummer I know of in Texas. And the drummer in her band was like, uh, Hey, what's up? You know, uh, which was kind of funny. Uh, and, and the, the, I looked online, the description was pink Floyd, uh, with added sunshine or something. And so I was like, you know what? All right, fine. I don't want sunshine on my Pink Floyd. Well, you know, I thought, well, that could be interesting because maybe it's like happy Pink Floyd and I want to see what that's like. I would have agreed <laughs> with neither of those uh, descriptions of the band. It definitely wasn't the best drummer in Texas. I mean, this woman was fine. She was a fine drummer. But the, like, there were other people uh, like on the bill that night that I thought were better um, to each their own. That's fine. Uh, and then I would never have classified them as Pink Floyd anything. Uh, the bass player in that, in the, in, in Pearl Earl was the highlight for me. This woman, it was an all female band. Uh, but this woman, like she owned the groove. She laid everything down and she had a look like she was pulled right out of, a uh, Robert Palmer video from the, from the eighties. Like it was that kind of, you know, the Bob haircut with the, the, the black outfit and stuff, but, but she, she dominated. She was great. Uh, so I watched like half their set and then I was like, I got a six o'clock flight or something in the morning. I got to go. <laughs> um, but they started late, but they didn't have to. It was, I was, I was in the club walking, uh, you know, the band prior finished at like mm, uh, 1132 or something PM. And I heard the stage manager go up and tell the other band. So, uh, they finished eight minutes early, so we've got a little bit of time, but technically your changeover, you know, we're now in changeover. So, you know, get up on stage whenever you want. Like they, they're getting their stuff off. They're almost done. And they waited another 15 minutes before they started putting their stuff on stage. And then they had to start five minutes late. And, and that was their fault. Like there, there was no reason for that. Uh, and it was the, it was notable because it was the only band I saw start late. Everybody else started on time or even five minutes early, every single person, which, which is amazing from a lo the logistics standpoint, you know, by the, oh, that, by the, by the time a well you're run, that's a well-run festival. Absolutely. And every club was like this. I never like saw one where it was like, Oh, well, we're running 20 minutes behind, which by, you know, the band started at eight o'clock by the midnight band to say you're only 20 minutes behind. That's pretty good. <laughs> like, amazing. Right. Yeah. You, you know, but it never happened. No. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's just interesting stuff. There's so much, you know, I, I mean, and obviously I'm there to enjoy the music, but I'm also there to do exactly this, like to soak this stuff in. Cause I, I love, sure. I love it. I love seeing how the logistics work. I I'd love to be part, like a fly on the wall for the pre-production meetings where they pull all this stuff together and say, okay, here's what we communicate to the bands. Here's what we, if you are a band that played South by this year, I would love if assuming that's not like, you know, going to get you in trouble for telling us, I can't imagine it would, but. I, I, there are, there are crazier things. Uh, if you, if you send us, you know, I would love to, to know what they told you, how they coached you to make this a success. Cause they clearly, they succeeded. And I, I would love to, to share that. So feedback at gigabpodcast.com. Maybe I'll ask my friends at South by for that too. That would be a handy thing to share. Cause mm. yeah, I, it was just amazing. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. There was one band that I saw. A band called My Education, Paul. They were, um, I'll call them a bunch of old guys. They're, they're like, you know, our age. So, you know, take, take that for what it's worth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but much older than most bands playing at South By, which are in their like, you know, 20s, early 30s kind of thing. And they were an, a band from Austin, all original band, um, all instrumental. They spoke between songs. But otherwise it was, it was all instrumental and they did an interesting thing. They had, uh, a, a person running, I'll say running lights, but it was the, the only lights were like laser effects being projected on the stage. I, it, I, I tried to figure out what they were using. It might've been this Chauvet DJ scorpion thing, but it was like patterns 
where the lasers were were making it seem like like motion through a tunnel. So watching the band, you just had like this constantly moving tunnel motion that added to the band's visual sense on stage because they they didn't really move around a ton. They would not have been all that interesting to watch without this. But having that added to the sound, obviously they were playing, you know, playing these songs was enough to to fully engage me. And so I, I got to figure out what they were using. I mean, it wouldn't be the right effect for like the house rockers or even bitter pill or fling, but it was an interesting thing for this sort of heady instrumental music to, to keep people kind of engaged. And I mean, it was kind of a stoner vibe, but it, like it, it worked. I don't know. It was, it was interesting. So, um, yeah, maybe they'll, maybe they'll tell us too. I would like to know. Now, again, not that it would be the right thing for most bands, but it was, it was an interesting, whatever they were projecting on, it, and it wasn't, it was just like onto the, 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 the stage. It wasn't on a screen behind them. They were literally just projecting at the stage and the, the patterns were happening on the musicians, on the instruments. It, it didn't matter. It was just a big, you know, the, the, they, the people were the backdrop for this laser visual thing that was happening. It was bizarre. I've never seen anything like it before. Not not for a, a thirty five minute set, but it worked. So, cool. yeah. I think that's all I got from South by. You got anything else to uh, for us to ramble about today? I'm, I'm done rambling. I think I'm done rambling too, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for listening, folks. If you have any thoughts on any of this stuff specific to the questions we asked you, or about anything else feedback at giggabpodcast.com we'd love to hear from you it means a lot to us thanks for listening I know you said it earlier in the episode Paul but I don't think we can put too fine a point on it say it again would you please always be performing <laughs>